Hi everyone, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, we're looking to start this at uh, half past 12. I can see there's uh, quite a few people on board, which is great news. Um, looking forward to delivering this. So we'll give it another 30 seconds and, uh, and then we'll jump into this presentation. Hi guys, fantastic. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we appreciate your time. Obviously, uh, it's, it's a great subject and a great area to learn more about. Um, we are going to be recording this and, and we will share this around as well at the end. Um, very uh, lucky to be joined by a couple of really good guests today as well. So looking forward to touching on that as well. Um, I can see there's more people just joining the room now. So we'll give it a couple of seconds and then we'll look to jump into this presentation. Uh, so this is, we're, we're talking today all about how to acquire property with your SaaS. Uh, it's a presentation put together by Source Capital and Wealth Builders. Uh, and we're going to give a little instruction on uh, the different parties with us today. Um, so yeah, let's, let's jump into it. Says that with confidence and then can't find the button. There you go. So first of all, obviously, I mentioned there's two parties do the presentation today, and we've got a guest as well. Um, so first of all, Sourced. So um, my name is Stephen Moss, uh, Managing Director of Sourced. Um, we are here um, and, and very focused on changing and revolutionizing the property investment uh, sector, uh, introducing a lot of technology. We have five different key divisions in our business. So Source Property, Source Development, Source Capital, source franchise and source care. Um, if anybody's seen any of our presentations before, we, we've generally gone into a little bit more detail, but ultimately five areas, uh, five property, sorry, five companies that work very closely together um, in the property sector, delivering new build homes, conversions, HMOs, and lots and lots of different strategies and structures. Um, we've also got with us uh, wealth builders. Um, I don't know if you want to, I can introduce Kevin uh, Whelan with us today. I think that's actually on the next slide to introduce you properly, Kevin, but while we're touching on uh, Wealth Builders, so Wealth Builders is obviously a home of seven steps to wealth program. Um, would you like to give us a, a little introduction, Kevin, to yourself? Hi there, Steve. Uh, yeah, Kevin Whelan, founder of Wealth Builders. Our passion is helping people to create, build, and then ultimately protect their wealth. And there's no better strategy to do that with than with property. And of course, if you can find untapped sources of funds to help you continue your property journey, then what better news is there than that? Absolutely, fantastic. I know there's lot, going to be a lot of good things coming out of the presentation. So, so yeah, I mentioned myself earlier, business founder of Sourced, managing director, um, being in the property sector for about 20 years. Um, Kevin, if you can kind of give us a bit of an overview of your background, obviously you've introduced us to Wealth Builders. Yeah, so um, as the founder of Wealth Builders, I'm also an author, a business owner, and I suppose mainly in when it relates to property, I've been experienced since the credit crunch since 2008, and have funded, you know, probably now five or 600 joint ventures. So I can speak to the hearts and minds of investors, and I know how investors and developers, those people who want to raise money for projects, can work very, very well together. And some of that I'll share with you today. Fantastic, excellent. Oh, we've got another guest with us today, so Johnny Vernon. Um, hi, Johnny, welcome to the uh, presentation. If you can kind of introduce yourself to the, the people watching, that'd be great. Yeah, hi, Steve. Uh, hi, Kevin. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Johnny Burnham, and I am a director of Source Chester, um, along with my business partner, Terry O'Neill. Um, we have the, uh, the Chester franchise. Um, I also am an active uh, SaaS investor, uh, which we'll obviously we'll talk about later on. And we have just recently completed um, our first um, SaaS loan back project um, at the back end of last year. Fantastic, excellent. So getting all that experience on your belt with the SaaS and what you can do and lots and lots of different ways. I know you do speak to a lot of people uh, and kind of share that experience. So I'm looking forward to hearing some of that as well today. Right. Um, 
I'm going to hand it over to yourself, Kevin. So if you, if if you're, I'm not sure if you're able to click to move on, or if you want to tell me when to push the button to move you on to the next part. Um, oh no, I feel like we're going to be doing a lockdown presentation. Next slide, please. I don't know. I'll I'll check that in a moment for you. Um, but this, just so you're aware, in my background, these are, you know, I'm a dedicated to the science of building wealth, and I've written three books, including the latest one, which will be. Um, released soon, which is The Wealth Coach, uh, co-authored by myself and Bradley Sugar. So I can't make that available, but the other two I'll make free to anybody who's on the webinar, just to say, hey, thanks for taking time out of a busy day to pay attention to you building your own wealth. I tip my hat to you for doing that. As far as the, um, Steve, just as far as being able to access the presentation itself to move forward, I can't do that. Um, so if you could move one on, that'd be great. I'll just say next, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> so in the kind of wealth building process, and I suppose you yourself, whatever you're doing, whatever reason you're here, you're not here just to do property. You're here to build your wealth. And as you begin with the end in mind, a great quote by Stephen Covey, of course, you know, there's uh, it's a key requirement, I think, when you're looking at wealth. And so what's your number? Is it? You're looking for 10 properties, 20 rooms, 50,000 a year, 100,000 a year, whatever there is, there's a number that's underpinning what you want to do. And my experience as far as property is concerned is that people who do property, because, you know, it's not cheap, is it? It's not like buying the stock market, very easy, very liquid. There's uh, that lack of liquidity. It means you've got to leave money. Well, more often than not, you're leaving some money in the deal or you've got to raise some money for deposits. And so therefore, most people run out of money before they run out of ambition. So I want to share with you today, um, and certainly the next slide will reveal that, which is this kind of idea that there is no lack of money. There's a huge amount of resources available that are out there. What I think most developers, those people who want to raise money for projects, often don't see is where that money is. And often it's really right under your nose too. But what I'm gonna share with you is how you can unlock the vault, how you can get access to the pin code. And I'm gonna share that with you in just a minute. Next, please. Just lost you, Steve, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. No, yeah, we've moved on, so. Um, can you see the next slide? We've opened up to the vaults open up with home equity, personal cash investments. Yeah. Yeah. For some reason, my bear with me because my laptop just the power just of technology. Put, hey, <laughs> we've we been go. doing it. Doing got this you back, again. Got you back yeah. again. There you go. No problem again. So, this is where money is stored. This is where money is at. And you could probably identify this for yourself in the sense that you know, you probably tapped into your home equity, you probably looked at using your own personal cash, uh, but out there in the real world of accessing money to do more property, you've got to, no property turns into a, a cash generator for you, either cash flow or capital, unless it's funded. And therefore I wanna share with you that sometimes looking at the obvious sources, you're not really the best ones to go for. So most people when they're reaching out to private investors are looking at personal cash. And you know, it's a challenge. Everybody's got challenges and struggles and trials and tribulations with their cash right now, particularly in uncertain times. And business owners, well, you know, they're stockpiling cash because they're concerned about what will happen in their business. So the thing that I found to be true about property is to become outstanding in your niche. Um, so if you can become outstanding in your niche in property, I can show you an outstanding niche to go through to generate money that you can build up by becoming super investable, a huge flow of funds, including, as I say, money you might not have spotted yourself. And that is going through the big yellow door through the world uh, that I call pensions that most people simply switch off and hit snooze. So I don't want you to do that. I want you to move on and I want you to look at, you know, what I'm gonna share with you next. And for most people, they have got somewhere in their life, some money that has historically been accumulated. 
whether through personal contributions, whether it's through a job, whatever it's done, it's basically a part of your past. And there are two sources of money, your pension and other people's pensions. So just give me a few minutes of your time to talk about both of those. And let's talk next about what the pain and the confusion uh, that, that are happening when it comes to pensions. So if you click on, please, Steve. You see that most people completely disconnected with their pension. There's confusion, they don't know how it works, you know, frustration, they can't use the money for the things that they want to do. There's almost a level of, I need to park this money, do not disturb, almost in a little vault of its own to later, and then I'll get round to it one day. But you can use that money now and in some respects create a joint venture with yourself. And I want to show you next the joint venture that just simply is terrible. And just click through all of those, please, Steve. So what I'm showing you here is a joint venture in action. And I want to know whether you'd sign up for this joint venture. So I'm going to ask you, just go back, please. That's it, thanks. I'm just going to ask you if you would like to sign up to this joint venture, where I'm going to ask you to invest with me for the next 30 years. In the long term, you're going to get about 6% on your money because what I'm going to ask you invest it, to invest in is in the marketplace that goes up and down and you simply can't control it. And sometimes it's very volatile, sometimes it's quite stable. But usually in your lifetime, you're going to see two or three massive, massive changes and shifts. We know this is the stock market. I'm going to charge you 2% to manage your money for you. So your long-term return is six. I'm going to charge you two. So your net profit on average for the average investor is going to be 4%. And in this JV, I'm going to put none of my own money in. I'm going to take zero risk, but I'm going to take a third of your profit, two out of six. And if the market goes wrong, I have no accountability whatsoever. I ask you, is that good value for money? If you're into property and you're into doing other things, there is another way. And I'm going to show you next exactly what we do to try and show people how they can make better use of their pensions. I think that's a great slide as well, like Kerry, and it's quite a powerful slide, isn't it, to actually dumb down um, you know, pensions in terms of what people are doing. That's, that's, uh, it kind of hits home just looking at that really, doesn't it? Well, it does to me, which is, <clears throat> and as an IFA myself, you know, I realized in 2008, I really, with best intentions and all honor, I couldn't serve people anymore because I couldn't stop that incredible volatility where ordinary people saw 35 to 40 percent wiped off the value of their money. Now, OK, fortunately, some people bounce back, you know, the market bounces back uh, and it will do that. But what if somebody was like, I don't know, say 59 and three quarters and they were looking to retire at 60 and they pinned all their aspirations on doing that and they lose 35, 40 percent. And if they're only going to draw four percent, you know, if you want to have a decent income, well, you've got to multiply that by 25. So if you want 100 grand a year, say, you know, you'd be happy with that. That's two and a half million. Well, the average pot in the UK at retirement is less than a tenth of that. So most people are only getting kind of 10, 12 grand from their pension and then still with uncertainty and volatility. And there's a better way, Steve, isn't there? And that's what we will talk about next. Absolutely. So the thing to talk about now is a new piece of language. <clears throat> Excuse me. And whenever you get into any form of asset building and wealth building, there's language to learn. You know, Steve talked about um, what they do in source and there's so many different types of property strategies and, and different ways. And I'm sure Johnny will talk a little about what he's done. But so, you know, you're learning a new language when you're building your wealth. And the language that I want to share with you is something called an, a SAS or SSAS. Now, it doesn't mean, you know, it's software as a service. It doesn't mean it's a branch of the armed forces. It's unusual language and it's not created for marketing at all. It's created simply through legalities. So let's move on to the legal statement, Steve, of what a SAS actually is. So you can uh, just click through on that. So essentially, it's a retirement vehicle 
but unusually because it's only for business owners. It's like turning your pension scheme that normally somebody else would be in control of. You get that control for yourself and you can use that money to invest in a whole range of things that would be a reflection of how you want to build wealth. So if you like stock markets, great, you can do that. If you like business, you can invest in business. If you like property, you can invest in property, more details in a moment. But if you want to invest in Bitcoin, you can do that. So there's all sorts of things you can do once you're in control. And that control no longer is just a, a paddling a canoe, a single person vehicle. You can have up to 11 people combining and collaborating together. So you can have family members. So in my case, I've got myself, my wife, and three grown-up kids. And that's a million pounds tax-free haven for up to five people, not for one person, because you're collaborating and connecting and creating a trust fund for your family. And I think it's a very powerful thing. Um, and we'll get into this, I suppose, during the course of the presentation, Steve. But I think you've got in mind to ask a few questions yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's exactly what you've just said, isn't it? It, it came to, it, it's a very powerful thing. There's lots and lots of, um, you know, I, I don't like to use the phrase, what really cool things that you can do with your SaaS. And ultimately, uh, we're going to touch on it today, particularly in the property uh, sector and how it can work and help you. Um, we put a poll together. So um, for the guys that are watching this uh, on the Zoom link, then um, we've got a couple of polls that we just wanted to share Um really just to get an idea of um you know what what people uh what the, the position people are in uh you know if people have sasses if people are looking at sasses um so that's the first question i'm going to sh share this now um and the idea behind this is ultimately we can um you know we can then feed back as well let people know what their position is and where they're up to etc so you'll see a poll that's popped up guys um if you could click on where you are um I think there's three answers. There's a yes that we we do have a SAS pension. There's a tran we're currently transferring SAS pension, um, and there's a no. Um, we're currently researching. So um, quite interesting. So we, we did a similar um, similar poll on this uh, when we spoke about SAS um, last year, um, and you know it's, it's interesting to see some of the differences. Uh, I've wrote down some of the some of the changes. So to to give the the results uh, for everybody. So. Um, the question was, do you currently have a SAS pension in place? 27% of people that are watching are yes. 8% are currently going through a transfer. Um, no doubt, potentially dealing with Kevin already. Uh, and then 65% of people are currently researching and looking to get into the SAS world, find out more probably. And this is a, a great uh, presentation and way of uh, finding more information because that's, that's one of the key things. If you're at that stage where you're looking to uh, to get into SaaS and, and be new to SaaS, do the research, watch all these types of uh, online presentations that you possibly can, and just become a sponge ultimately. Because there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, really good people out there willing to share information, experiences. So like Johnny's on the call today, he's you know his experience is great because you can speak to him and see what he's done with his SaaS, and we'll we'll touch we'll, we'll jump into that very shortly. Uh, and obviously we've got Kevin who uh, can share that with us as well. Um, so yeah, cool, fantastic. So a little bit of a poll. We're going to do a couple throughout the, the presentation today. Um, but yeah, I'll pass it back over to, to yourself, Kevin, in terms of what you can do with your SaaS. Yeah, so as a, as a teacher of SaaS and someone who runs a company which is an independent and impartial guide to SaaS, SaaS is a high-performance vehicle. And like any high-performance vehicle, if you don't get a little bit of instruction, you run the risk of crashing and burning. And we We've definitely seen that and the penalties for getting it wrong are quite severe. So, but 99% of people get it right in the same way as you could do wrong things in property. But if you get good education, you get good support, you've got good connections and you do thorough due diligence, you're fine. So what can you do? Well, you can bank, you can buy, you can borrow, you can bridge, and you can even boost your money. So you can actually get access to more money than you've got yourself. So let's take each of those in turn, Steve. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So I think we're looking at the bank first. Yeah, and the bank strategy, this is for old geezers like me, right? So I can't tell who's on the call and what age they are, but let's get rid of this for the older people. If you are um, age 55 
then you can take 25%. I'm going to show you how you can also take a loan back from your pension. We'll cover that in the borrow strategy. And you can draw income um, as well as the cash, almost like a, a pin. You know, you just go in and you can and get access to your money. But because you can get the loan back, which is 50%, and the same more of that in just a moment, and the 25%, you can really get 75% of your money out of your pension, essentially really just leaving in the tax relief. But all the while you've been building that, you're building and compounding the money completely tax-free, free of income tax, corporation tax, inheritance tax, and capital gains tax. So it's a brilliant way to compound and build your wealth tax-free so that when you're ready to take it from any age after 55, you've got a very substantial pot. And that can be up to a million pounds, give or take, per person, completely tax-free. So definitely worth having a tax-free haven in your, like, in your life. And we call it a family bank. It's, it's basically your SAS starts life as a bank account and you're in control of the bank account. Nobody else tells you what to do. It's down to you. Now you can get help, of course, like you would do you know, with a surveyor on property or you might get a lawyer, but you can get help what's known as an administrator who can help you with just taking care of getting access to your money and keeping all of that legally uh, compliant as far as HMRC is concerned. Because so, high, so tax privileged, you've got to stay within some rules. The next strategy uh, is called the borrow strategy. <clears throat> and in this case, whatever the value of your pension is at any time, there's no time restriction here, unlike taking money in the banking strategy, you can borrow 50% of your money. Now, so if you've got the average we see when they Start SAS is, um, in my group is around 300,000, give or take. So say 300 gives you 150. You've got 150 approximately. You can borrow that money um, and pay yourself back. So you become the lender and the borrower. So therefore, you can choose the interest rate you want to pay yourself. Now, if you want to pay a big interest rate, you can. My experience is most people who are raising money for property want to pay a small interest rate so that more of the wealth is accumulating today in their business life. Um, and so therefore you can get access to the money at 1% over base. Now base is currently 1.1. So you can get access to money for in the region of, you know, 1.2 1 to 1.5 in that kind of region. Now I know, you know, whenever you're looking to source property to get property, you're going to get funding for property. You probably can't find a mortgage that's going to let you have money at one point to 1.3%. Now it is a five year repayment loan, um, but you're borrowing it from yourself. So the chance of default, pretty remote. Funds go to your company, so you need a limited company. So that's another qualifying criteria for SAS. There are four qualifying criteria. If you wanna know what they are, reach out to me and I can explain that to you separately. But one of those is you need a legitimate limited company because it's a company pension scheme as was shown a bit earlier on. And the loan needs to be secured by way of a first legal charge. And you can take that first legal charge on any asset that can be independently valued. So it could be a piece of property you own, the property you're buying, a debenture on a company, you know, a whole host of things. We get a bit gray there. Uh, so SAS is a mixture of science and art. And the artistry, obviously, you know, we look at uh, in each individual case. But in broad terms, you know, there's so many ways you can create the security for the borrower. And how it works, you'll see uh, on the next slide. Just to touch on that as, as well, <coughs> Kieran, um, when you talk about 1% of a base, you talk about per annum. That's, that's what you have to apply. Oh, good point, Steve. It's 1% per annum, not 1% a month, right? So that's bridging funding. This is you lending to your own uh, company at 1% a year. So say you lend yourself 100000 you're going to pay you know, roughly £1,200 a year, £100 a month for access to that money. Uh, so it's very, very low cost. So thanks for cleaning that up, Steve. Good point. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, got... so, so essentially, when you're looking at, you know, your SAS then, it no longer becomes a pension. It becomes a wealth building tool. So your wealth is at the center. And then you can decide how you want to use that money. So it starts off, you know, you create it in the SAS. So just take a look at three o'clock there. So your SAS gets started. 
you make a loan to your company and then you repay the interest and the capital back to your SaaS. Meanwhile, your company is using the money. So where the company gets the money, what it does, as long as it's in keeping with what the business does, the business of your company, and most people, excuse me, have property companies. So therefore, you can use that money for property. And we've got a very simple case study in the next slide. Yeah, fantastic. So we here I have a client of mine called Chris, who set up a SaaS from an old company pension scheme. He borrowed money from his own SaaS. Uh, with that money, he bought a 12-bed HMO. Um, many people use their loan backs, by the way, to buy unmortgageable properties. Because it's not a mortgage, you're using the money for yourself. You can buy a property that nobody else can buy with a mortgage and basically buying cash. So it puts you in a very strong position. Now, the interest rate he was paying to himself was 1.5%. That's the interest rate he chose. And then the income that flowed from the rental from that HMO flowed to him and his company. It didn't flow back to the pension because what went back to the pension, of course, was the interest rate. Now, you can use that money that flows into your company for any reason. And the main reason that Chris got very excited about using his SaaS in this case is evidence from what he did with that money, which is he used the proceeds for that money to do something very special, which you'll see next. Now, Chris has a daughter, that's the daughter there called Alex. Now, Chris shares this story, so he's given me full license to disclose his story. Alex suffers from a medical condition called cystic fibrosis, which he likens it to breathing through a straw. And when you breathe through a straw, obviously in times like now, it's not a good place to be. And people who have this condition really don't live as long as average life expectancy. So rather than wait and Chris to leave a legacy for Alex when he died, she's more likely to predecease him. So the issue there then is the proceeds and the profits for his, from his company, he was able to then secure a property so Alex could live rent free. And you can see what's the ROI, ROI on that? Completely priceless. Yeah, what a lovely story. A nice <clears throat> thing to do. That's yeah, fantastic. and this is the this is the artistry. I said it's a mixture of art and science, and scientifically we're talking about money, but in the end, money's an idea. Money is an exchange, and it can be exchange of value. Of course it can, but it can also be exchange of value, not just measured in monetary terms, but in emotional terms, uh, and so many good things around that uh, that SAS can do. And because there's collaboration everywhere, as people now increasingly now, there are 4,000 of us, in our community, taking control of our pensions, bucking the trend, essentially in a way, Steve, sticking maybe two fingers up to the society where you saw, saw that joint venture of the financial services industry getting rich on our money instead of us keeping the money in the right for profit where it belongs. You know, but I won't get on my soapbox too much. <laughs> today, right? No, fantastic. We'll talk about the buy strategy next. Excellent. Now the buy strategy basically means you can buy anything. I touched on some of those things um, in terms of whatever you feel you know about, you can learn about, that you can build your wealth. Remember, SaaS is a wealth building tool. It's not just a pension. You can do that. And of course, commercial property is a hot topic right now, particularly with all the planning rule changes. Uh, so commercial property, definitely a strong suit and commercial to residential. And I'm sure... Uh, Johnny will have something to say about that as you share a little more about him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, obviously first-hand experience, so it should be good. Um, so, yeah, Johnny, um, I, I think it's a good time to kind of bring you in a little bit just to kind of give us... I know we're going to touch on uh, the projects you've done before, but um, you've had first-hand experience of, uh, of, of using this strategy in your, your SaaS. Do you want to give us a yeah. little bit of an overview? Yeah, yeah, it's fine, Steve. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so a bit, a bit about myself. So I've come from a banking background. Um, and I know that Kevin uh, touched on it previously at the start where 
you know, you get you get a copy of your 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 pension statement. But I'll be honest with you, I I never looked at it to be fair until I probably turned forty. Um, so uh, twenty one years uh, finance background, um, and we. Uh, myself and my wife, um, we decided to take our corporate pensions um, out of the banking world and create a, a SAS trust for, for our family, because um, that, that's what it is at the end of the day, it's, the, it's a legacy for your family. Um, and we've gone through a couple of our personal projects, but we, we had access to these funds and the strategy that, that we did a lot of research was the loan back. Uh, for the for the SAS, um, which we'll, we'll we'll talk on um, in a moment. But yeah, so we have to spend, you know, as it says there, it's a bit, bit, a bit alarming really. But twenty five years paying into a pension, um, and as people say, it's your biggest bank statement, but you never actually look at it properly. Um, and after doing a bit of research, and I actually did speak to Kevin probably about eighteen months ago now at the start of my journey um, to just explore the the, the, the loan back process. And that's what we did. So we, which I won't take it away from the the slides uh, in a moment. But that's what we focused on was the loan back project. Yeah, fantastic. So I'll look. So that this uh, the slide that's popped up then is this one of yours, uh, yeah. Johnny? That you've you've done the conversion on. Yeah. So this this property here is um, it, it was a, a family a family house uh, on the outskirts of Chester. Um, and we we bought it because that that particular property would be double the price in Chester, but three miles outside of Chester on the border of Wales. Um, what we've done is we've turned that property into an all uh, three bed all ensuite rooms, and class it as a corporate let. Um, we purchased it in March, two thousand and twenty, the week before lockdown. So um, we, like everyone else during that time, uh, went through a number of hurdles to, to try and get over the line, including planning and, and multiple lockdown, English lockdown, Welsh lockdown. Um, but the intention was to actually create a, um, a house with larger rooms than you would find in the city centre, but actually charge higher price than the city centre by focusing on corporate lets. Um, and we, we completed that project um, in December of last year and it's fully rented at the moment. Oh, fantastic, excellent. So you managed to do one, not just um, utilize your SaaS and go through a whole conversion, but you did it all in lockdown as well. <laughs> yeah. And we, yeah, wow. and we had to abide by Welsh rules <laughs> wow. with, it being, with it being on the border. But it, it, what was interesting with doing this is um, at the time, I was getting a lot of feedback from people to say that you wouldn't actually achieve the rent that we would that we were advertising at. Um, but once completed, the, the property was let out within the first uh, two weeks, all three rooms. Fantastic. And that was just really by doing a, a higher spec, having that focus of the type of tenants that you're looking to achieve, attract and achieve. Yeah, high spec. I mean, you touched on lockdown, Steve, and an important point to note, and Kevin might talk about this as well, the beauty of having and working with a loan back or being your own bank is you determine the interest rate, you determine the loan, the loan term, and you can determine the payment schedule. So by doing what we did, and as much as it was a um, nightmare situation because of what everyone else is experiencing, we can we took control of everything. So this this particular loan back is due to be paid back. Uh, well, it's been refinanced now, so we've hit hit, hit the twelve month <coughs> mark. Um, but we we gave the own interest rate, and we decided whether we were going to do it over a year, you know, over two years, or you could do it over five years. So we did it over 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 twelve months. But given the situation, you had that flexibility of okay, we'll keep your payments down, do the work, which is what we did. But actually, you're not paying out anything for twelve months until you've refinanced. So that, even though it was a bad situation, which it has been because of lockdown, having this uh, payment plan worked to our advantage. Yeah, fantastic, excellent. I think you. I think Kevin's going to touch on the kind of um, the bank or the, certainly the bridge side of um, 
uh, of SAS as well. So yeah, just just go back to that slide if you don't mind, Steve, because there's, yeah, there's sure. a couple of extra points there that, um, although Johnny, that's a great story, but you know there are so many opportunities, and lockdown has definitely presented some of those. I think some of our clients have found councils who haven't been, you know, fulfilling their obligations for the maintenance of land and and abused technology <clears throat> through sourcing software, which I'm sure you'll touch on, Steve, to be able to identify those properties. Others have got council grants uh, for bringing, you know, retail premises, you know, back to life. Uh, so there's lots of opportunity to, as I say, get unmortgageable properties, but also a lot of people think pensions and property don't go together, but as well as commercial offices of all different kinds and uppers and lowers, you know, shops with uppers, we call shops with tops. Uh, we've got Com Resi projects, we've seen barn conversions, pub conversions, church conversions, railway station conversions, police station conversions, basically anything that can be converted. And the rules of being able to do that under permitted development have got even more flexible. We've had clients who bought shopping precincts and got the flats above, um, and not only using their own SaaS, but increasingly now is this movement of people taking that responsibility. And I can see there's a few people in the audience today who've done that. I recognize some of the names and they will also be exploring that, but you can also collaborate with other people's SASs. And we've definitely been involved in the funding of good projects where people collaborate and bring their SASs almost like a, uh, a common pool of money where individuals are sharing in the value of a project, which is not the money they've got. They've, uh, they've loaned money to somebody else and therefore the power of that collaboration uh, comes out. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I think um, you know, Johnny's a really good, good example of taking advantage of the situation, like you say, and, and there's lots of other people that have done the same sort of thing, but it's nice to see um, people doing this rather than kind of sitting down and, and there have been a few people who have sat down and looked at it negatively and things like that. But there's also been the, the more entrepreneurial that have took advantage and, and you know, uh, come out of it shining, if you like, from the other side. Mm, and let's talk about that in the bridge strategy. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, obviously you can talk about source, Steve, and you can use money for peer-to-peer -peer platforms, but your money can be bridged and, and loan to business owners or platforms. Do you want to talk about source capital for a moment? Yeah, so obviously um, anybody watching who's aware of source, and um, we touched on the business earlier, we, we've uh, a division of our business source capital is uh, a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, lending platform. So um, we're going to go into the property and how we source properties, et cetera. But this is another way and another route that you can utilize your SaaS in the property sector. Um, and that's investing into uh, property or development loans that are then utilized um, for developers, the likes of Johnny, who can go away, build, convert, renovate properties, uh, refinance or sell the units and then repay the funds back to the investors. So um, our peer-to-peer -peer platform follows this, this route, if you like, and, and avenue. Um, we work with a lot of the investors that are on uh, today and, and, and looking at this. And it's another avenue, I suppose, really. Um, and I imagine you, you follow the same sort of or, or discuss the same advice, Kevin. When we speak to people who've got SASs, we usually talk about um, utilizing different avenues, not just take all your pension out and put it into one particular thing. We used to talk to people about, okay, a proportion of your pension is gonna go into maybe a, um, a loan or maybe um, buying a property, commercial property, but then you do have uh, people that also use part of it to invest into projects like peer-to-peer -peer platforms, et cetera, and just get a, a kind of hands-free return on that basis. Oh, absolutely right, Steve. And I mentioned earlier on that SAS is a tool that should reflect your own wealth building. And wealth building is best done when you don't put all your eggs in the same basket. Now, there's nothing wrong with putting your eggs in a basket if you know, you're particularly paying attention to it, like you're buying a business premises for your business. I mean, that, that would work. But if you're trying to diversify and get not just greater levels of return and greater diversification of return, but greater knowledge and building kind of a greater capability so you learn more for the future. We see a lot of this lending and learning and let's give you an example of that on the next slide. Yeah, absolutely. So those of you paying attention might recognize the same face, which is uh, Chris again, but this is Chris and his wife, 
Tracy, who uh, took a long time, a year, to make up their mind that they wanted to take control of their final salary pension. He was a banker, a bit like Johnny. And he said, you know, as a banker, I thought I knew about money and I didn't. And now I am a bank and I love being a bank. And in his case, when he started this off five or six years ago now, I connected him to uh, one of my property developer partners um, and uh, who had 150 rooms and run out of money. So both of them wanted something, but they needed to be connected for that magic to happen. And I made that connection. And it'll be, become obvious what both parties received when you see the next slide. <clears throat> so Chris and Tracy didn't know about property, but wanted to learn. So they got a good return on their money, certainly substantially higher than they would have got in the stock market. And Chris, unfortunately, same name, um, but it's, that just happens to be the real names, you know, was getting great returns on his property and just a genius at finding a best use of space. You know, and I saw his properties in Newcastle where he did that when I went to see him. Uh, and his specialist area was HMOs. So both of them got an incredible value, but that value wouldn't have existed without the connection. So this is the whole point about the bridge strategy in SaaS is about collaborating, connecting, resonating, learning and changing the way that you do business. And I think that's a, a very useful thing that makes actually how many people enjoy working with their pension? You know, how many people yeah. have ever, when Johnny said he used to get his statement and read the statement and wish it were better and put it back in a drawer or filing cabinet, or maybe if he was in a bad mood, he shredded it and lined the hamster's cage with the, with the paperwork. But what, there wasn't any enjoyment going on there. But this is a place where real enjoyment takes place. Do you think that enjoyment is because of the control element? You, you know, you kind of, the first time you get your pension statement, you open it up and there's an element that you're interested in. But obviously the next quarter or per annum, if you depend on how you get your statements, if you're opening the, the, the statements up and there's, there's no kind of increase or there's nothing really happening, you can't really control that. Is that do you think that's the element or the drive that people just stop reading them ultimately, don't they? I think they do. And I think when you've got no control and you don't even know why, there's nothing you can do. Whereas in this case with Chris and Tracy, you know, they saw what their money was doing. So they understood it. So, you know, that was a good ROI. That was a return on their intellect. They had a great relationship. And now, you know, they're, they're best friends. They went, you know, Chris went to the other Chris's wedding and now they start to do commercial to residential projects together. You know, that's a return on interaction. That's an ROI. And of course, for those people who, you know, feel passionately about their money doing some good in society, there are many projects which are supported living or helping um, veterans or helping people with special needs. There's all sorts of things where you can get a return on impact. So that enjoyment comes from any combination, Steve, of those ROIs. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, on that basis as well, we're following, kind of following that, we've, we've got another poll that we wanted to to fire out to you guys so um let's just bring this up myself um no that's why there you go seamless let's click the right one that'll, that'll help um so we talked obviously about different strategies and um, kerry's gives a really good insight into the, the different ones available well, we want to see what you guys think you know which strategy um from the SAS strategies would work for you or interest you so we've just launched a, a poll there if you could select the ones that um interest you then that would be great it gives us something that we can kind of feed back and, and uh, support people with as well so we can see the results coming in which is good excellent we'll give it a couple of seconds there yeah and hopefully everyone's Jumping about a bit. There you go. We'll we'll leave it there. We'll close it now. So, um, so yeah, interesting. So twenty percent are interested in the bank strategy, thirty four percent in the buy strategy, thirty four percent as well in the borrow strategy. The biggest one is the bridge strategy, which is quite a, a common one. Um, and then we've got the boost strategy, eleven percent. And obviously, um, there's a number of people who, who don't have that SaaS in place yet, but obviously still interested in particular strategies. So. Bridge is quite a, a popular one. I think it's how a lot of people do utilize the SaaS. And as those examples that you give, gave us before uh, of how uh, Chris has, has used is really good in, in terms of, and it's helped him develop not just relationships, but 
his wealth as well. We're going to touch on the boost one. So are you able to give us a bit of an insight into the boost? Because this is a fairly new one that you've kind of introduced, Kevin, is it? Um, yeah, I've got seven, but I'm only showing six today. Uh, yep. The boost one is really because we talked at the early, at the beginning of our discussion today about you know, how to acquire property. Well, the more money you've got, the more property you can acquire. So other than, you know, what can you do to bring more money into your SaaS? Well, you can make contributions from your business um, and you can add contributions and, and, and work together with other people as I said, up to 11 people. But let's look at the external leverage and the internal leverage. So externally, you can borrow money from a bank. So if you've got that 300 grand, you can borrow 150 from a bank. So an external bank. So this isn't you lending now, this is you borrowing from a bank and saying, hey bank, I'm gonna buy this property. I've got 300 grand in my SaaS. Will you lend me 150 for it? So, you know, there are banks that will do that. You can also connect with bridging companies or you can have two people with two SaaSs joining together. Or as I said earlier on, you can make loans or receive loans, inward investment, from others, we call them third party loans, that's just a technical definition, but it's really the, it's the bridging strategy as well. It's combining your money with somebody else's money. So there's just different ways of doing that. And you know, you can also consider inviting your family. Uh, you can have, as I said, up to 11 people. So there's just ways of either connecting with other people, connecting with other people's money or connecting with pre professional institutions that gives you more money than you actually realized that you had available. And if you have more money, you can do more deals. Absolutely. Fantastic. And it's, um, you mentioned there uh, about, you know, it's just jumped out of my head completely, but yeah, the leverage inside, so boosting. You, sorry, yeah, the question I was gonna ask you there was that about the banks. So is it is it quite common for high street banks typically that, that would look at this? Yeah, high street banks pretty much because, you know, SAS has been around since the 70s, so the, the, the older and more established the bank, the more they've seen SAS as before. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a good thing. Although SAS is still a relatively new phenomenon for most people, but I think the reason why it's coming into play more and more, Steve, is because since, you know, Section 24 and the government intervention in the private rental market, we've seen more and more property owners who previously might have owned their property kind of husband and wife say in that joint ownership way have incorporated they've created a limited company and because they've created that limited company they're now in a position where they were eligible for SAS whereas they wouldn't have been before and so we've seen a proliferation of incorporation and a proliferation of SAS and we're just thrilled to be at the cutting edge of that helping people discover whether SAS is right for them wrong for them um, and whether they can execute the strategy so they don't get confused. I'm sure we'll have some questions, Steve, in the <clears throat> Q&A. Yeah. I haven't had a chance to look yet because I've been talking, but uh, I'm sure there'll be questions that some of which I'll probably have had before and um, seen many times and some will be new questions. But either way, you know, that's the whole point. This is a new area of wealth. So today's presentation won't make you an expert, but it might make you curious enough to want to know just a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And obviously legacy is a, it's a <clears> term <throat> that Johnny touched on as well. And uh, I know you use it quite often uh, you kind of tie into how does SAS work with, with that? Yeah, for the most part, you know, traditional pension is a one person vehicle. So as a single person vehicle, what normally happens uh, on your death is you say, well, if I die, I want my pension to go to whoever's nominated. And then for the most part, that money tends to get paid out. And when money gets paid out, it's not really the same kind of legacy because if the money's paid out, it's then in the tax net again. Whereas with the SAS, you can invite your children in as trustees when they reach 18. So it means you can hold the family trust, which all of our SAS clients, we ask them to name their SAS. So, you know, you could have ABC Enterprises, but they'll name their SAS the... Whelan Family Trust or the Moss Family Trust or whatever they choose to name it. So it essentially begins to acknowledge that it's their trust fund. It's not an insurance trust fund. It's not a trust fund run by a 
financial institution and therefore they when you die that fund needs to close down in some way it's more about it's a perpetuation of the legacy for the next generation and because you've got a lifetime allowance which means the amount of money you can have tax-free um, of a million pounds approximately per person the more people you invite into your family trust the bigger that legacy is because you can build a legacy of a million pounds per person and when you die the money stays in the trust but it doesn't affect the lifetime allowance of your children so you're just giving so much more value to the legacy and wisdom to the legacy because you try and get your children involved so instead of I don't know there's a bizarre expectation in this country which I find unusual and I've tried to change it certainly with uh, people who we work with at Wealth Builders is instead of just leaving your money to be paid out on death but you've given nobody any wisdom to be able to accumulate it still further if you just distribute the money it will dissipate after about you know three generations it will be all be gone so what we do is combine the legacy the family trust with a family charter that creates a set of rules uh, that you want to leave a legacy within uh, your heirs. You know, you teach them things so that instead of having a family bank that just gets paid out, it's a family bank that perpetuates. And then it's a self-replenishing family bank account and the next generation and the next generation want to carry that on. And then hopefully they'll be toasting you as the pioneer of this idea uh, and raising a glass to you in 150, 200 years time. And that's what legacy means to me. It's not just about, I want to leave money to my kids when I die. It's much more than that. Yeah, no, I mean, that's absolutely fantastic. It was very powerful thing for us when we looked into SAS and, and one of the key key reasons, and obviously, as you say, you know, it, it's there for generations, which to me, on that basis, there's, there's no better reason than, uh, <coughs> than to construct, construct a, a statue of me. Um, <laughs> you know, to, to celebrate throughout the years. I was so. thinking of a portrait, Steve. I, I thought I could be very ever, ever so regal, sitting astride yeah. a horse, getting a portrait. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. And you touched on obviously being tax efficient as well. Do you, do you want to expand on that at all? Yeah, I mean, the, it, it's, a, it's a pot of money. I call it the tax-free haven that most people just don't realise is there. Um, you know, the reason why pensions get bad press is really because it's the financial services institutions that get wealthy on the back of them. This is a way to change that. And when you realize you can compound your growth, you can compound it through leverage, you can compound it through uh, making capital gains, make, getting income streams, uh, making and receiving loan backs, uh, making and receiving loans to others and bridging to others. It's a way just to super compound your money in a way that you just can't do if you leave it to the stock market. You can bank the gains as you go. You can secure the profits. You can diversify them into gold or to crypto or indeed to the stock market. But because in a SaaS, you're in control of it, you can control your costs. And, and yep. the costs are so much cheaper in the long term. But the tax efficiencies are, as I said earlier on, I think, income tax-free, corporation tax-free. Not just that, you get the tax back you paid in your company. Uh, capital gains tax-free and inheritance tax-free, not just for this generation, but generations beyond uh, you and I. And I think there's no better tax-free haven than a, a well-used SaaS, which does mean, you know, you've got to use it. And not all SaaSes are the same because, you know, different, just like all vehicles are not the same. You know, if you want a, a vehicle that needs to drive off-road 45 degrees and you're on a farm, you're not going to have a Mini. You know, you're going to need a Range Rover. Well, SAS yep. is a bit like that. You need to understand what it is you want to do to then be able to choose the right SAS. And certainly from my point of view, as a holistic, impartial guide to all things SAS, we're tied to no SAS provider. We've got a spreadsheet, a calculator actually, that links to all of the fees. So if you tell us what you want to do, we can connect you to the lowest cost, but also the, the SAS with the right uh, flexibility in terms of the rules, because all SASs operate with rules. And you could have a rule with the SAS, say you want to do a com to resi conversion, but they say, no, we don't do that. You can buy commercial, but you can't do com to resi. Okay, well, I'm going to do a loan back. And as Johnny said, he didn't pay any money 
in the first 12 months. So essentially you can get free money. Oh no, we want you to pay monthly and in advance because every trustee will have a different set of rules. So when people find out about SAS, there's a temptation to DIY it. Yeah. There's a temptation in, in within many people to go, oh, well, I'll just go for what looks and appears cheap. But what looks and appears cheap can have a sting in the tail uh, or certainly could have costs that you simply don't know because you don't know enough about what you can do in a SaaS. And as you move with your SaaS, as you grow with your SaaS, it's a journey of transformation. And when yeah. you transform yourself, you do bigger, better things. You know, that lend and learn, for example, you might learn to do something you didn't know how to do before. So you didn't ask that question of your trustee before. So, so many trustees I meet, those of you who have SASs already, you, know, you could find that you get to a point where your fees suddenly ramp up that you didn't realize they were going to, or they say, no, we won't do that. So we prefer to talk to people who are exploring SAS. So those of you who are thinking about it, I would implore you just have a conversation. You know, if you don't resonate with me and my team, that's fine. We'll be more than happy to point you in a direction that still serves you rather than have you buy twice or find something you want to do you simply can't do. No, absolutely. I think it's really good uh, kind of summary there in terms of, uh, you know, how, how it works. Obviously speaking to the experts and I know we do that and anybody, anybody that's looking for uh, SAS advice, we always pass them <coughs> over as well. So we've well, had lots appreciate of appreciate that, Steve. That's, it's kind to be associated with you guys. I know you're passionate about property and you've got many creative ways. And I love creativity because in a way, SAS is bucking the trend, right? You're not going with what normal people do. You're fighting against what's normal. And I like that kind of person because it says, you know, I'm willing to take responsibility and I'm not just going to go with tradition just because most people stick their money with an IFA, leave it there for 30 years and kind of look and see what's happened. I don't believe that's the right way to do it. No, absolutely. But I think, like you said at the beginning, taking control of your own future and your own destiny, absolutely, you know, building that wealth, definitely. Um, so, yeah, guys, so obviously um, everybody that's, that's, that's watching and, you know, we appreciate your, your time. Um, we talked at the beginning about how we're going to look at SaaS and property. And I think Kevin's given us some real good insights in terms of different ways and strategies you can use SaaS and how you can apply that to property. Um, we've seen lots of questions coming through. So we, ha we have got a question uh, part at the end that we're going to jump onto. But one of the questions that I've seen pop up a couple of times is, can you buy a residential property in your SaaS? Uh, Kevin, I'm sure this is a question that you get answered quite a lot. Uh, but if you can kind of give us an overview for the guys that are listening today, that'd be really helpful. Yeah. So it's interesting. This residential property in SaaS, it's a question I get every day. So it's one of those pound in the pocket questions. I'd have absolutely bulging pockets. Uh, but the issue is, you know, as far as pensions are concerned, a SAS is a pension. So because it's a pension, it can't directly own and hold residential property. However, there are ways to indirectly accumulate residential property. You saw the loan back from Chris when he made a loan back to his company and the company bought the HMO. Uh, there are also different types of property uh, residential property, taxable residential property, and um, uh, tax and, and property that is not taxable. Uh, things like care homes, guest houses, certain student accommodations, certain holiday accommodation, certain supported living type of accommodation. So there are many ways where that artistry comes in. And this is the skill that with most SASs, you're going to find, particularly if it's a uh, a, a big company SAS that has thousands and thousands and thousands of people and most of them are SIPs and then they've got the SAS on the side, they're not going to go anywhere near anything to do with residential property. But the law does allow you to do certain things. And all we want to do is say, that, well, there are some trustees who understand property investors in the same way as you've got certain mortgage lenders who understand property investors or certain accountants who understand property investors rather than just file accounts in a traditional way. So I would say it isn't possible to hold residential property, but it is possible to buy directly or to hold certain types of property that can be residential, but is deemed to be not taxable by virtue of some special considerations, which we can't cover in detail now because we're going forever, I think, Steve. But suffice to say, 
um, I've given you a signpost to a few of those headlines like supported living, like holidays, like care homes and the like. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I think it's, uh, it's a real good insight. And, and like you say, um, one of the best things about property and one of the things I love about property is you can use your imagination, you can be creative. Um, and I think it's the same, you, you know, obviously ensuring that you're within the law, but you can apply that. And, and there are lots of ways indirectly that you can uh, purchase uh, residential property. One of the key things um, I kind of come across when I'm speaking to people, particularly with the SAS, is it, it's that kind of common feedback of um, they've got the SAS set up, there's money sat in there, um, and it's finding the right property and, and properties to buy. And what we've done here is, as a business and as a group, we we do work with investors in identifying properties. We thought it'd be great to put some of our kind of key ways that we identify properties to buy, uh, particularly that you could use, utilize your SAS for. So. Uh, some of the slides on here are talking more about property sourcing, identifying those investment opportunities um, and using them, um, you know, using the power of your SaaS and the different strategies that Kevin's touched on and how to get them. So look, first of all, where the deals come from. So if, if anybody's kind of followed any sort of online training or there's lot of kind of these gurus that talk about property and property sourcing, it, it's quite surprising how often you get people that talk about we only deal directly to vendors or directly to sellers. Um, we're not looking for, for general stock that's on the market. Um, and for me, that's kind of like a, a big kind of myth. That there are ways that obviously you can get direct to vendor. There are ways you can approach sellers that aren't putting on the market. But it's important to look at actually where do most of the properties come from. And over 95% of the stock of properties sold come from estate agents. So it, it's not, it's, there's no point in viewing it and saying, okay, let's, let's not approach them. Let's not look at them. Um, obviously, people will be aware of the sort of powerful uh, platforms and, and portals out there. So the likes of On The, uh, on the Market, Zupa, Rightmove, Rightmove being the biggest. And you've got smaller ones that, that have sort of classifications of properties. So Gumtree, uh, Prime Location, a little bit different, and obviously Source Property. So we have um, we, we sell on average about 60 properties per week um, on our, our website as well. So they're all investment properties and lots and lots of different strategies that your SaaS can be applied to as well, whether it's HMO, conversions, renovations, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, so looking at where the deals come from. So the first part is obviously platform, uh, sorry, yeah, portals, platforms, making use of them. So when we, we bring people on board in our franchise side of the business and let's kind of touch on that, um, we have uh, about 150 franchisees across the UK um, and ultimately they're looking for investment opportunities all the time. So we help and support them with generating leads um, and looking at how they can source investment opportunities. And the first part is making sure they're getting set up correctly. So, you know, when they're searching on portals, utilizing keywords. So um, Zoopla have a really cool bar that if you go into advanced settings, you can put keywords in and um, I know a really popular one, as an example, is um, put, putting in flats in the key search um, and then actually changing the criteria to, to houses only. And what that does, it brings up typically small blocks of flats that you can potentially get discounts on, et cetera. Um, so that's one of the kind of key areas and tips that we teach. Um, setting up daily alerts. So on the portals, making sure that you're really precise and specific with the criteria you're looking for. You don't just want an email coming through from Rightmove listing hundreds of properties every day. You want to be looking for specific types of properties um, so that you can reduce the time that you spend on these portals and make them work for you uh, rather than spending lots and lots of time kind of skipping through the different opportunities. Another way, obviously, once you set up online um, is using these uh, leads that come through as icebreakers. And this is more sort of talking uh, about the advantage of working with the agents. Uh, and again, rather than just focusing on direct to, to vendors uh, or direct to sellers, then you know, working with the agents, making sure that um, the agents are aware that you're actively looking. And, and one way that we always approach this when we're, we're doing our training with franchisees is talking more about actually put yourself in the shoes of um, the agent. You know, you can imagine being sat there as an estate agent, you probably get, 10 calls a day from potential investors that are looking for similar sort of things uh, registering with you and it's how serious they're going to be and you generally find that that investor that rings up and registers doesn't ring again they just sit and wait for stock to come through so 
it's been quite proactive. It's been quite consistent, you know, having the extra human contact. So if you, you register with the agents, then pop in, you know, if it's just before work or on lunchtime, uh, pop in, introduce yourself, do it again in a couple of weeks time, just to see if anything is cool. And what you're doing is you're putting yourself at the forefront of the agent's mind. So when something either um, comes up that could be potentially a good refurb or flip or anything like that, um, it's a great way of, uh, of getting to the, the front of the queue. One of the tricks that we used to do, um, and we used to find a lot of properties off the back of it, was we used to go into the agents. Um, typically in between appointments, we'd pop in um, and we wouldn't ask about new stock. We'd talk about the old stock. So we, we'd talk to them about, is anybody looking to sell quickly? Is anyone getting, you know, uh, any, anybody got any problems or what properties have been on the market for a long time? And then look at those as potentially we could offer solutions to, to speed up those uh, transactions and, and obviously then start to utilize your SaaS uh, with those as well. Technology, um, I know you touched on it earlier, Kevin. So um, some of the, the, the ways and tips that we, we find and identify properties. So we've listed a couple of ones that we, we utilize. One in particular, uh, Land Insight. So if you haven't seen the uh, Land Insight platform, I, th I don't think we've got time today. I'm kind of skipping on a couple of these because we, we've gone on um, a little bit longer than what we, we expected. But ultimately, Land Insight, a very, very powerful tool you're able to search in a, in a map function, identify plots of land, um, properties. But one of the ways that we've had the real success with it is identifying properties with huge gardens and then approaching the owners to see if we can split the garden uh, to get planning permission on that property. Um, another really powerful platform um, that we utilize every single day is property data. So property data from memory do a free trial. Um, if not, I'm sure it's only about seven, eight pound per month lots and lots of really good, powerful um, data uh, points. And they also have groups as well. So they group properties together in terms of repossessions, um, reduced properties, and, and it saves you a lot of time, again, setting up alerts for different types of strategies that interest you and uh, you're able to move forward on. It gives you a lot of powerful information as well for making decisions. So if, you, if you're looking particularly at, at HMOs or you mentioned before about um, holiday lets, uh, being able to, to hold those in your SaaS, then uh, this is a great tool then to identify holiday lets and look at the average price for holiday lets or room lets and, uh, and putting all your figures in your uh, deal calculator and crunching the numbers down. We touched on uh, planning portal, uh, sorry, planning portals, which is slightly different than the, the sale portals. So uh, lots of planning portals, local council planning portals that will update you on any new plans that have either been accepted or refused. And they're a really good one to touch um, with, based with either the architect or the owners directly and introduce yourself um, as a potential buyer or JV partner. Um, and again, utilizing your SaaS in different ways for anything that's received planning or, or even been declined planning. And auctions as well, I'm sure everybody's come across the, the auction structure. Um, but again, a great way to find investment opportunities. Um, another one I'd add on there, maybe not so much technology, but one we've had a lot of success with ourselves is looking for um, surveyors that also sell properties. So you generally find in most towns and cities, there are a handful of surveyors that um, will just list a couple of properties on their site for sale. And those properties are usually either been there for a while and the sellers are very open to negotiation and, and structures. So we've actually just recently um, purchased a property which um, we convert into 20 apartments with an additional 40 apartment new build at the back. Um, and that was through one of these uh, surveying companies that sells properties on the side and just puts them on the website. They don't go on to right move or anything else like that. Um, I can see lots of questions popping in guys. So we are gonna have a bit of a question time at the end. I know we're, we're overrunning slightly, so apologies, but um, we will answer as many of them as we can towards the end. Networking as well, obviously a huge, huge one. It's been a little bit quashed in some respects and, and obviously Zoom's become the norm, which I'm sure everyone appreciates. Um, but we're starting to see networking events taking place again. Uh, we ran our own networking event um, called SIN um, through, it wasn't last year, the year before, the year before that. And real success, so over 140 franchisees across the UK. Um, and it was great because we, we had speakers coming along, guest speakers, we had them right across the UK. Um, we did something which I thought was amazing, mainly because it was, it was my idea. Um, but we had a, a deal wall. So 
we would actually bring live deals to the scene events and we'd, po we'd post them on the walls um, so that people can look at opportunities. And, and again, it's a great way to find off-market properties through local people that, that have the same sort of interest. So, so look out for the scene events. I know they're starting again soon in the next couple of months, uh, as are lots of other uh, events taking place. In terms of source ourselves, so obviously we, we touched on the fact that we've got this, this great network across the UK um, and we're selling about 60 deals a week on average. So it's interesting to look at actually where our deals come from. As a business, we analyze over 300 deals a week. Um, 100 of those are found directly by our franchisees being local and out meeting people and networking, et cetera. Uh, 100 from sources, so trading amongst ourselves and our network. And then 100 from what we class as a list, so through um, portals, et cetera, that we take and we uh, we then put, generate lists onto the back of those as well. So quite an even split, to be fair, across the, the 300. Um, our goal is to, is to build this up and build this up so our network grow. And a lot of properties that we trade are, are done within the network before they kind of reach the, the list or the, uh, the email campaign status for investors. Identifying a property. So I think this is, this is an, another good area. So it's not just a case of feeling like you've got a good opportunity or good investment. It's also making sure that ultimately um, you're doing your due diligence, you're highlighting any red flags and overview, you're crunching the numbers and you're getting some kind of um, certainty in terms of, you know, is this achievable? Are there comparables? Is there evidence? Uh, we've done a, a recent webinar all about this. So if you get a chance, uh, go along and have a look at the YouTube channel for Sourced. We've got quite a few videos on there to help people either as a new to property or experienced already, but looking at how you identify if the property is a good opportunity as well. How deals are presented to you. So setting the standards as well. So it's not just a case of you've got your SaaS set up and you're looking to identify properties, but if you're going to work with sources and you're going to identify people, um, it's making sure that you, 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 know, you find out what experience they have. Um, you, you spend time either having a coffee with them, getting to know them, uh, looking at the figures, making sure that, um, the information that's coming through is correct. One of the key things we teach a lot about is not changing your um, DD process because a lot of people will naturally um, find a property source or someone they can work with. They'll send over what, what looks like their due diligence and they'll just run off the back of that. It's really important when you're working with property that you have a due diligence process, you follow that. Uh, regardless of how the information comes to you, you can take out certain information, put it into your process and follow that through. And again, we've got um, videos on our YouTube. Uh, we also share actually uh, a book with one of our, our one of our investors. Uh, we work with closely uh, wrote a book about the due diligence process when investing in peer to peer. So I'll make sure that that gets added to this link and sent out as well. So it's a it's a great thing to look at. It's got a, a checklist of uh, when you're actually doing investments, and it, it's quite powerful. The feedback we've had from it's been really really positive. So I'll get that added to the link for you as well. Overview. So first, uh, analyzing what you're looking at, obviously the strategy, the numbers. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, as I say, we, we've overrun a little bit anyway. But ultimately, we've got some videos and, and separate webinars where we've gone into a lot of detail here just to help, help and make sure that what you're investing into is going to give you the returns and help you achieve your goals at the end. Typical process. So kind of tying the property process in with your SaaS. Um, it's probably one that I'll fire back over to yourself, Kevin, just to talk about these are the kind of bullet points that we've got going through the process. Is, is there anything you'd add to this? Or we've got a typical uh, process of 18 weeks once you've kind of uh, set up your SaaS and gone through the identifying. Are you finding anything different in your sector? Uh, I think in lockdown, there's the kind of there's been an additional length of time for HMRC to, to do their due diligence. Um, but also, if people are moving pensions, you know, they, they kind of want to move their frozen, their forgotten, or their fed up pensions, any of those X, then that can take a bit longer depending on who that company is. So usually in our process, uh, we look at the four eligibility tests. We look at the pensions to see if there's gonna be any challenges. And one, when the application is into HMRC, we're kind of creating the strategy in that 90 day window, because you mentioned something earlier on, Steve, which sounded like a casual statement, but I thought, oh, hang on a minute, I need to jump on that, which is 
people who get a SaaS, then all of a sudden the money arrives in the bank account and they go, well, now what? There's loads of time in that period when their SaaS is being approved. They could be writing that strategy and designing that plan. And, and I find it's often the wrong way around. So we encourage that before, but I think it's 90 to 100 days from start to finish uh, as, as far as SaaS is concerned. So, you know, yeah. um, I guess that's slightly longer than this, but that's why you need to plan ahead and you should never ever commit money from your SaaS until you know the money's in. Yeah, no, definitely. definitely. I mean, I've heard some stories of, um, it actually leads on really nicely to Johnny, actually. Johnny's going to give us a bit more information about his his venture, but Johnny, what was your time scale for converting your, um, setting up your SaaS? It was for some time, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, we, we um, uh, I think, at the time, I, I, it was Bank of America and uh, Virgin and, and uh, also Lloyd. So it was combined because of, of different mergers. But we found the, um, the transfer process took at least five months and it was painful. More so because a lot of the people we were dealing with had never heard of SAS or what we were trying to do. So you found yourself in a position that you're actually educating um, you know, pe pe people within HR departments. And like I said before, I'm, I'm finance background and the amount of people in the finance world that actually still don't know what a SaaS is. Um, so that was that was our first hurdle. Um, and then, um, yeah, so I, th I, th I think once we'd come past that and we got through the HMRC approval, um, we then had our own, our own goal, our own strat strategy um, that we were focused on which I can talk about now, Steve, you've worked in the conscious of time in that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you, you've, um, if you can kind of just give us an overview, we've, we've moved here to the, the project, obviously, you, you, you give us a bit of an instruction before. Yeah, um, yeah so our goal um, at the start of the process was, how can I replace my income after taking redundancy from the finance world? But also, in the, in the long run, I'm talking like three to five years, what can we be doing to replace my wife's income in the next three to five years? And our strategy was to let the, doing, start enough doing the loan back. Admittedly, we would like to be on our second loan back by now, but because of the period we've been doing things within the pandemic, that's unfortunately uh, ski it a couple, uh, uh, by a few months. So I guess as before, the aim was, what can we do? How can we utilize our pension to replace my income? Well, this is what this is the project we talked about before. This is now yeah. generating cash flow. Um, and the aim is to repeat this model again um, in the next uh, few months. So overall, it's a it's the refurbishment project in Chester. It's a corporate let. We've got three double ensuite rooms, it's fully furnished, done to high spec. It's got two kitchens, two gardens, off-road parking three cars and it's on the outskirts of the city centre but we're charging city centre prices um, so so yeah and then I think you've got the figures on the next slide I think as well haven't you yeah so um, financials for the project purchase price was 122,000 when you are utilising a loan back to complete this process as part of the process you need a risk valuation on the property so we had a, a figure in mind that we had to hit a certain market value for this project to work, um, which we did. So for this particular project, um, the valuation came in quite high. So the unfortunately for the couple we were buying off, they wanted a quick sale, which suited us, but it hit a market value of around about 155. So with the, the loan back, the loan back will lend you up to the market value of that particular property. So that gave us some wriggle room to do our, our refurb costs. We did dip into, um, and I know you've got a picture of them on, on here somewhere. We did dip into the kids' savings to top up because we were doing it to a high spec. And at the end of the day, this is for the kids in the future. I haven't told them yet, Steve, but you know, <laughs> really won't mind. Um, but generates um, a gross income of 21,000, net income 11,000, uh, gross yield 11.6%. Net 6.17 ROI 25.7%. Uh, this isn't one of those deals where you can pull out all your money. Um, we know we've got money locked into this, but given the figures, um, we can pay that back. 
within three years. But the beauty about this is we've actually got a property that is held within our company. So it's not the SAS because obviously it's a loan back. Um, and we've managed to get hold of a property use, utilizing this, this way. And we haven't had to save up for months and months and months or years to put a deposit. So yeah, it, for us, it was, a, it was a quick way in for our, um, for our own uh, portfolio. Yeah, brilliant. No, it's fantastic. You know, it's fantastic. It looks amazing as well. I mean, I've seen a couple of projects that you've done, Jay, and everything, the finish always looks absolutely brilliant Yeah. Uh, in terms of what you do, et cetera. Um, Thank you. I know, obviously, um, you, you've, well, actually, Johnny, you, you, while you're on, um, you, you've obviously took part in this as well. We, we offer a earn and learn and know, I think um, the, that Kevin mentioned it before as well. So another alternative way is that you can actually invest in projects and kind of go through the projects, um, the flow in terms of the, the development, et cetera. It's been a bit tough for the last 12 months due to the COVID lockdown, but um, it's something that, that I know we offer. And uh, if any, any investors watching are interested, then certainly reach out and find out a bit more information about that. Um, yeah, I think it, it's good to call out as well, Steve. The, the loan back was only 50% of our SaaS. The other 50% yeah. we've, as I pointed out before on, there, on the slide, is done by the peer-to-peer -peer lending platform. So um, our first project with yourselves is due to pay back at the end of May. Um, but that's also given us an opportunity to look at the development of the Exchequer project in Bournemouth uh, and what you've done and the, the QS involved, the figures, um, and you know that's given us some appetite for us to look at some bigger projects um, in the next uh, three to six months. Yeah, fantastic, excellent. Well, that's really good, brilliant stuff. In terms of source capital, obviously we've touched on this a little bit in, in, in ways that you know it's we peer to peer platform. Um, we complete um, the bank bank grade due diligence on all our properties and offer first charge security. So if anybody's looking for a little bit more information on this, please visit sourcecapital.co and you find out all the, the detail on there or speak to one of our team, more than happy to help. Uh, we've got our final poll of, of, uh, of the day. So I know we've gone over a little bit, I do apologize, um, but I'm sure you'll all agree there's been a lot of really good information coming across. Um, quick, quick question really to everybody, if you would be interested in Earn and Learn, um, if you, you know, click yes, no, or already an expert, fantastic. Um, so we'll put that there for a couple of seconds just to find out really what, what the appetite is and, and what sort of projects, like Johnny said, it, it's kind of giving a bit more information to go into potentially bigger projects. Um, so we'll end that. We've had quite a few uh, click on that already. Fantastic. Um, so, yeah, so 74% are interested in more uh, information about earn and learn so that's really good so it shows a real insight in terms of people want to learn more about property and utilizing their SaaS in that way as well so we'll we'll follow up and send some information out about it after this as well so so questions obviously uh, throughout the whole thing we've had quite a few questions coming in guys we do appreciate it and as i say i'm sorry we've not been able to spend time doing the, doing them all um we will send out a recording of this um and I can see a few people asking for exactly that, basically, if it'll be on YouTube, et cetera. So we will share out that link. Uh, one of the questions a few people have asked, and this is for yourself, Kevin, is how much is the minimum that I need to start with a SaaS? Uh, if you can kind of give people a bit of a feel for that, please. Yeah, sure. It's a good question. It gets one of those pound in the pocket questions. And it's the answer is surprising. It's zero. Because if you believe that you want to create a family trust, a tax free haven for your family, and you know you have got some profit in a company you want to gradually build up, or you've got some small pensions you want to gradually add to, then you know we have created something yeah. called a starter SaaS, which essentially means you know people right at the beginning of their journey can do that for you know probably around about just over a thousand pounds or so, all done, and that means you know they've got their own personal family trust fund, and as long as they believe they're going to make profit as long as they believe they're going to make contributions or they've got some pension they want to move, you can start with zero. And we're the only company that have created a starter SaaS for people right at the beginning of their journey because we get this question a lot. So thank you very much for asking it. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, unfortunately, Johnny's just had to shoot off, but he has said he's happy to share his uh, email address on uh, on the link that we send around as well. So we'll, we'll do that. Um, Another question that's come through um, for yourself, Kevin, is uh, how can we move from a SIP to a SAS? 
that's dead easy. Um, a SIP is usually very flexible pension, so generally no penalties. Anything you want to do or you're doing in your SIP can be done in a SAS, except you don't have ongoing costs associated with the percentage of funds, it's fixed fees. Uh, so we do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of SIP to SAS transfers a year. Would you care to guess how many SAS to SIP transfers we do, Steve? I could imagine very, very little, yeah. Zero. We never done one. Uh, so everybody moves one way because when they get the power of SAS and what it does for themselves and their families, they never, ever, ever go back. And if you want to talk to people, if some people are still sitting on the fence, you know, I understand that. You could talk to any number of people who've moved their SIPs to SASs in our community and they'll share with you their experience. So don't think about it from listening to me as someone who has a company and therefore has a commercial interest in this. We'll connect you to people who don't have any commercial interest in whatever your decision is, uh, but they'll tell you the truth and then you can make your own mind up. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, lots and lots of comments as well about, uh, you know, Kevin, great presentation, lots of really good information. So, you know, it's nice to, to highlight that as well. Thank you. Um, we've got one here, short experience to date is careful consideration of your SAS administration. Plus you really need to understand what a professional trustee brings to the party, if anything. So I suppose, I think you've touched on this a couple of times, uh, Kevin, in terms of making sure that you understand what you're getting into. It's um, you know, it's quite important that you, you digest it. I know, I know you work along with people in terms of training and supporting them, and I imagine you cover this area as well. Yeah, I mean, look, the as I said earlier on, a SAS is a very powerful vehicle, and with great power comes responsibility to get it right. And I believe that a professional trustee sitting alongside you is needed unless you are extraordinarily diligent. Maybe you come from an actuarial or accountancy background, and, and you've got a system... To, to deal with not just the compliance, but also um, you know, dealing with moving the money and making sure you don't make mistakes. Now, some people who do that, nothing wrong with that. So you do not need to have a professional. The average cost of a professional per annum is like an accountant, about a thousand pound a year. If you wanna save a thousand pound a year, you could do it yourself um, and that's fine. So you, know, you don't need a professional if you don't want one. Yeah, fantastic, excellent. Great stuff. I know we're going to obviously cover a lot of this. Uh, we've got some contact details there as well uh, for ourselves and for Wealth Builders. Um, so if you do have more questions or specific questions, or you'd just like to have a chat with Kevin, uh, you can reach out to him at wealthbuilders.co.uk forward slash sourced. And There's sure some resources that, uh, there if you click on, please, uh, Steve. Yeah. All right, fantastic. So you've got the SAS book, SAS videos and SAS guy as well. So there's lots and lots of information there that, that's shared, um, which, is, which is brilliant. I, I know uh, you're very focused on um looking at educating people and, and i think it's brilliant the, the, the work that's done uh, we've got another webinar as well um which we are going to be discussing sip and sas so um i'm looking forward to that at the end of uh, end of may so we'll make sure we send you some details about that um so make sure you register to, to come and listen to that so uh, quite a few of the questions have been about actual sip and we're going to discuss um uh, sip v sas and the difference and the benefits and process etc so that'll be uh, quite an interesting webinar for a few of the guys that are on today mm -hmm. we've also got a property networking event um end of uh, may 28th of may at Carlton park in cheshire so uh, if you're looking to to come and meet like-minded people um and fancy a game of golf um or if you just want to come along for a drink and a bite to eat um there are there's going to be a link uh, available you can see there the, the tickets and the link but we will share this as well as a follow-up uh, for people so uh We'll dust off the clubs and then, um, yeah. If, <laughs> so if nice to too... get people out again, isn't it really? Clinking glasses, shaking hands and uh, um, and being able to touch the flag. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the big thing. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and, and there you go. Sorry. So uh, I thought there was an anyone. So yeah. So thank you everybody for watching. Uh, massive thank you to, uh, to Kevin and to Johnny for joining us. Really do appreciate your time, guys. Uh, we're going to share all the contact details. I know it's been a, a little bit longer than what we were expecting, but I think everyone will agree there's lots and lots of good information there. Uh, I hope everyone has a really good day and look forward to uh, speaking to you all at the uh, the next event towards the end of May. So, yeah, thanks very much, Kevin. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Steve. Thanks to everyone. Have a good day now. Take care. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Bye-bye.